don't leave me. Jimmy, please don't leave your bestie. Jimmy, you ain't gonna leave me, are you? Woman, I'll be gone before the evening sun goes down. Jimmy, don't I give you everything you say you want? What have I got? I give you clothes. Clothes. I give you suits. Suits? Yeah. Singular, baby, not plural. One suit, that's all. One suit. Don't leave me, Jimmy. Oh, woman, get out of my face. Bessie Smith made only one movie, this brief film made in New York by Dudley Murphy. Yet it was a real first in other ways, too. It brought together the blues of W.C. Handy and the music of low-down black life with added choral material by J. Rosemond Johnson, a central figure in the famous Harlem Renaissance and a composer of Lift Every Voice and Sing, known as the Negro National Anthem. Johnson's and Handy's contribution to a 1929 movie, even this brief short, was an accomplishment of sorts. It brought black intellectuals to a popular art form in a way not possible in silent film. You might even spot one of Harlem's literary elite among the extras. But, Bessie Smith's movie that ended the decade of the Harlem Renaissance, along with these experimental films by Lee DeForest that began it, were among the few sound films of the era. This meant that the high renaissance of black culture in America had no medium to record or express some of the richest qualities of black life, its dance, its blues, and its jazz. Maybe this explains why blacks were not devoted movie fans. Out of thousands of American movie houses, only a few hundred segregated houses served blacks. Here and there in big cities, a tiny handful of blacks went to downtown theaters. But movies always seem to be made for somebody else. In the South, this point was made bluntly at the entrance to every small town theater with its colored balcony and its outdoor shadowy around the corner entry. In the North, the point was made on the screen itself. From earliest times in the 1890s up through the golden age of Hollywood in the 1920s, blacks were the butt of movies rather than the centers of the action. For years, they appeared only as blackened up white actors. They had rhythm and they could dance. Lots of funny things happened to them. And they mourned their masters rather than their fellow slaves. It's easy to see why the leading spirits of the Harlem Renaissance shared a contempt for movies. But occasionally, they tried to change them. James Weldon Johnson, diplomat, author, songwriter, and editor, remembered his own attempt. I wrote a half dozen short scenarios and promptly sold three of them. We saw the exhibition of the first picture and were so disappointed in it that we were actually ashamed to see the others. Johnson's films are lost, but its makers, a Jacksonville studio in Johnson's hometown, must have handled his idea in the same spirit as this Vitagraph film also shot in Florida. Even Oscar Michaud, dean of race movie makers, failed to please black authors. Charles Waddell Chestnut, distinguished author of The House Behind the Cedars, for example, was disappointed in Michaud's movie of his book. 
Langston Hughes, the most popularly known of the Harlem poets, enjoyed a lifelong infatuation with movies. But at the end of the 20s, his feelings must have reached low ebb. Hughes went to Russia as a member of a black company to make a movie about racial conditions in America. But even in Russia, which proclaimed an official racial equality, he felt betrayed by Stalin, who canceled the project as part of a deal to gain diplomatic recognition by the United States government. Bill Chase's cartoon in the Amsterdam News expressed Harlem's rage at yet another betrayal at the hands of movie makers. But despite the distance kept by the Harlem intellectuals, black filmmakers spent the decade challenging the monopoly of racist movies on the nation's screens. In 1918, they took on The Birth of a Nation, often thought of as both the greatest movie ever made and the single meanest depiction of blacks ever filmed. Emmett J. Scott and Booker T. Washington of Tuskegee Institute began a challenge to Griffith's film in Tampa, Florida, which they titled The Birth of a Race. Although not the first movie project of a black company, it was the first to have a big city premiere. Even though Booker T. Washington, the central black leader of the day, died in the midst of the project and the film lost much of its black ownership and militant spirit, at least some of its message survived the final cut. Despite its weaknesses and a disappointing showing at the box office, the closing World War I sequence of The Birth of a Race put on the screen a real first, the first visual argument for racial integration ever to appear on an American screen. But. If the birth of a race failed to reach its intended nationwide audience, it did inspire the founding of the first black company that averaged more than one production per year, the Lincoln Motion Picture Company of Los Angeles. Lincoln's movies ranged over a broad expanse of heroic black experiences, from homesteading in the law of nature, to soldiering on the frontier in the ranks of the all black buffalo soldiers, to life in the fast lane traveled by black high achievers. This fragment, in its deteriorated state, is all we have of their social drama by right of birth. Its hero is a high-powered lawyer played by Clarence Brooks, who saves the land and birthright of a woman of a black and Indian heritage. Hollywood would not dare tackle such a story of black social power, at least not for another half century. Of all the black filmmakers of the age of the Harlem Renaissance, we know the most about Oscar Michaud, his works survive in greater numbers than those of any other black filmmaker. Michaud took up issues of racial identity that not only concerned his audiences, but had animated the Harlem poets and Alain Locke in his book, The New Negro. At least one part of this new Negro grew out of the tension between rural and urban black life, a theme Michaud took up in two versions of his autobiography, The Homesteader, a now lost film of 1918 and The Exile, a 1931 film that we see here. Like many blacks in his audiences, Michaud was fascinated with the neither fish nor fowl feelings of recent migrants from southern farms to northern cities and the clash between the values down home and those in the big city. I saw some colored people when we passed through Chicago on our way out here, and many were quite light. Why, some of them were as as nice as, as my mother. In Michaud's movies, parallel to his city versus country theme runs another deeper theme that concerned Michaud and perhaps his black audience that was struggling with its new identity imposed by life in the city. That of color cast within black circles that stung almost as sharply as the racism imposed by historic forces outside the race. Baptiste, Michaud's hero to whom he gave a name as French as his own, chooses to abandon his beloved homestead and return to the city rather than marry across racial lines. In a fashion that became his trademark, Michaud solved the problem of black identity a little too neatly by having his fiancée discover a convenient Ethiopian mother in her past. I married her and we lived happily until she died. God rest her soul. And now you know the truth. In a career that turned out almost a movie per year, no topic seemed beyond Michaud's ambition. Lynching, corrupt preachers, bootleggers, and always done with a personal style that sometimes touched nerves and offended black sensibilities. 
Clearly, by the end of the silent film era and by the end of the Harlem Renaissance, Michaud's sheer volume of accomplishment should have placed him in the ranks of Harlem's literary lights.